Hello and welcome to the second of seven reflection sessions sponsored by the Catholic Bishops of Alberta and the Northwest Territories. My name is Fran Lucas and I am the National President-Elect of the Catholic Women's League of Canada and it is my pleasure to serve as moderator for today's panel discussion. Today's panel is part of a series of reflection sessions inspired by a pastoral letter released by our bishops on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross and entitled, Save Your People, O Lord, and Bless Your Inheritance, a pastoral statement on the impact of COVID-19 and the call to Christian renewal. A note for all watching, the pastoral letter, as well as the guides for each of the follow-up reflection sessions are on the website of Grandin Media. In their pastoral letter, the bishops invite Catholics from around the province and territories to review the impact of COVID-19 within their homes, schools, workplace, and society in general, especially in light of the gospel and the social teaching of the church. They ask, how have you lived your faith during this time of pandemic? Which values, attitudes, and behaviors have been most dear and will we want to hold on to moving forward? which may be in need of remedy or renewal? These are some of the questions we want to engage with our panelists here today. Today's specific reflection topic is the importance of the family. To help guide our reflection on this theme, we have with us an exceptional panel of Catholic leaders in specific ministry fields that touch upon this theme directly and that have been impacted by the pandemic in particular ways. Joining me in conversation today are Marion and Deacon Gerald Logan from St. Joseph's Parish in Grand Prairie. Deacon Gerald directs the Life and Family Office for the Archdiocese of Gouard McLondon. Tess and Greg Perialis, an Edmonton-based couple who have a long association with Couples for Christ. Teresa and Jordan Robinson from St. Vital Parish in Beaumont. Teresa is a campus ministry at St. Joseph's College at the University of Alberta. And Jordan is the principal of Ecole Mother Duvel School in Beaumont. And of course, Sister Lucinda Patterson, a Franciscan Sister of the Atonement and Executive Director of the Lorana Shelter in Edmonton. Welcome to you all, and thank you for taking the time to participate in this reflection session today. I'd like to start by quoting the bishop's reflection text on today's theme. This is what our bishops write. In a time of crisis, the presence and strength of the family is vital. During this pandemic, we have all witnessed examples of parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, nuclear families and extended families connecting more intentionally with each other and learning to interact in new and at times heroic ways. For some, this has been a time to rediscover their parental role as the first educators of their children. For others, it has been a time to strengthen the pre priestly call of their baptism, inviting Jesus into the domestic church of their homes through creative times of prayer, such as celebrating Sunday by participation in a live streamed Eucharistic celebration. For others, however, the pandemic has been a time of challenge and hardship in the family. On the one hand, the rules of physical distancing have meant, for some people, long separations from loved ones, accompanied by experiences of loneliness, anxiety, and even despair, while on the other, the recommendation to live within a cohort or bubble of immediate family members and contacts has introduced certain challenges of its own. Compounding these internal family stresses, some families have faced unprecedented external pressures, such as a sudden situation of unemployment 
or having to figure out a new strategy for childcare or education. The reported rise in child abuse and domestic violence in Alberta due to the pandemic is most troubling. So now we'll begin our panel discussion. And our first question sounds like this. How has COVID-19 affected each of you in your family life? And what have you valued most about your family through this experience? We're, uh, we're grandparents and our grandchildren live quite close. Um, so when uh, school was closed, March 12th, um, we became uh, the, the caregivers. So we were caring for our three-year-old grandson and then the uh, 10 and 12 year old, um, we were educating. Um, for us, it was, it was a blessing to be able to help our daughter uh, who continued to had to work from home. Um, and it certainly strengthened um, the, our family bonds. My, my, Gerald is Métis. And uh, I often tell the children we live like a traditional family because the, uh, uh, we are helping with raising uh, our grandchildren. Wonderful, great stuff. The, the other thing um, with, with the, the isolation that came with the, the lockdown or whatever we, that first phase um, here in Alberta, I have, I have sisters in BC and um, Saskatchewan and I tried to make a, a weekly call to them uh, just to stay connected. My, my one sister worked from home and didn't see anyone during that first phase um, except at, at, at a remote distance. So it, I think it was important to, to just reach out um, to keep the family, our, our family, um, connected as well. Um, Jordan working in the school, um, we were kind of keeping a close eye on what was happening in the news. And um, I remember on the Friday before the schools got closed, I said to Jordan, I bet by Monday the schools won't be open. And he said, the schools won't ever close, honey. And by mm -hmm. Monday they were closed. <laughs> I, so I still remember we were, uh, our, our ski trip for our school was planned and one of our students uh, you know, made a, a joke that I thought in my mind, he's like, guess, guess I won't see you Monday. And, you know, what I remember after that was just the quiet, just how, um, you know, going into the workplace was, you know, an empty building and you start to see how, you know, how much we miss the kids. And then I'm sure each one of us has experienced where the roads were so quiet, you know, and everyone, you know, followed through with uh, the lockdown and, you know, you could, you could start to see, there was benefits of, you know, things being quieter and a slower pace, but also, um, you know, you started to see how, you know, our kids asking, when can we see our friends, you know, um, when are we going to connect with them? And, you know, they never used to listen, you know, to the news, we'd play the news every morning. And then that kind of became like a, a little gathering for them to, you know, hear the updates too. So it was interesting, just the insights we got from that, you know, initial two weeks and then kind of settling in from there. We also have a in, unique situation where up until very recently, our, my parents lived in our basement suite. So we did kind of, you know, pull together as a family um, and used it as an opportunity to really grow closer even to my parents. Um, and at that time, it, it was good because my husband was working from home, Jordan was working from home, I was working from home. Um, and actually now my parents have transitioned to living independently and it's been at a good time because now he's back and we call it hyper exposed to all of the kids in the schools. And so it's better um, that they're in a safe distance. So now we're having to get creative of doing the Zoom calls and um, they'll meet us at the park and kind of stay a little bit at the, a distance so that we can still have those connections. But you yeah. definitely have to get creative um, in order to maintain those close connections. Greg and Tess, how has this affected your family? Well, uh, Tess and I have four grown-up children, two girls and two boys. My two daughters, Mary Grace and Mary Ann, 
have their own family already. My first daughter, Mary, Mary Grace, lives in Glendale, California, together with her husband and three lovely daughters. Well, my second daughter, Mary Ann, lives in Millwoods area, together with her husband, Anthony Obliada, and their two kids. We have three grandchildren in Glendale and two grandchildren in Millwoods. Aids ranges from one year old to nine year old. Our two sons, Michael and Matthew, are still single. And my elder son, Michael, lives at his own place in Millwoods area, while our youngest child, Matthew, still lives with us in the north side of Edmonton. So Tess and I have to stay home most of the time as we find it challenging to work outside due to, the, due to the pandemic. Thankfully, our children are allowed to work from home during this time. Okay. And uh, during this pandemic, our family, we, what we value most through this experience is the opportunity to be close to one another and to communicate more often through so social media using Viber, Messenger, or Zoom. You know, we have a daughter in Glendale, one daughter in Millwoods, another son in Millwoods, you know, and we live here in the north side of uh, Edmonton. And uh, almost every day, my wife Tess would contact our grandchildren in Glendale, California, and Millwoods using Messenger, you know. And uh, since March 22nd, when the government asked everyone to stay home, we started the online rosary family prayer every Sunday night at 9 p.m. After the prayer, we will have our family bonding, bonding time with our children and with our grandchildren, sharing our experiences with one another. And our five grandchildren would love to show their artworks that they have done during the week, or just simply showcase their, their latest dance steps that they have learned, <laughs> or just sing their favorite songs, you know? Now as grandparents, we are very happy to see our grandchildren displaying their talents to us virtually. Despite the limited time to play outside, they are still full of joy and positivity. You know? And during this month of September, Couples for Christ is having the event designed for parents with young children. During this time of pandemic, members of the Kids for Christ ministry and Couples for Christ are called to do random acts of love and service to others, especially to the poor and those in need. The program is called Global Day of Service, and children are taught by their parents to take care of God's gifts. So we call those young children as heroes at home and agents of God's goodness. The kids learn the meaning of those treaties, time, talent, and treasure. That's great, Greg. I think we can talk more about that in some of the other questions that we have coming forward. So please, let's remember to do that. Sister, did you want to add something? Well, I can add from two levels. Uh, Lorena's shelter is a first response. So we had drastic impact as far as how were we going to be able to get organized. And everyone, the team did wonderful. Probably the most painful component of this COVID-19 for myself personally. So we have two sisters in long-term care and I have not been able to visit them because of that. And I have to admit, even though we could now, I could go see them for an hour, I don't want to because I'm the one going out in the community, sometimes doing things. I don't want to bring anything to them. So, and um, watching mass being live streamed is a wonderful gift, but I truly, truly miss mass. Okay, really good. Thank you for, the, for those words, sister. So still thinking about our family, which values or attitudes or behaviors have been of greatest importance to you and will be going forward, maybe even more so. Is there a behavior that's going to continue that you perhaps uh, even are excelling at right now and, and, uh, or uh, something new that you've started that you're saying, this was good, we're gonna continue it? Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's one single thing. Okay. But, you know, with us, we, 
we've always been very close with our grandchildren. Um, and we spent lots of time with them. But to be with them, just, yeah, 12 yeah. to 16 hours a day. <laughs> well, maybe not quite 16 hours a day, but it, it seemed like 16 hours a day, uh, especially when that uh, remote emergency learning wasn't going well. Um, <laughs> you know, it, but, you know, we, 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 got to, we got to walk with them more than we did. I mean, we're both retired educators. So we, you know, just being with them as they're learning. We've always taken a big interest in their learning. We've always tried to enhance their learning, but we weren't part of the central part of their learning, I guess. Uh, you know, we've, we've both taught thousands of students, but our, our grandchildren were not some of those. So, you know, I, I value that. Um, and, you know, just getting to do the fun things too with them um, because rem emergency remote learning wasn't all about the hard stuff. There were a lot of good things in there too. And uh, with our backgrounds, we got to sort of enhance what the teachers were asking them to do with, with activities that we had used in our own classrooms. So we hear lots about um, the opportunity, and I think there were a couple of examples already given here today of our personal faith development. What, what, resources do you go to for your personal faith development and that of your children? Anything out there that's really wow? Well, jumping in there again, um, we use formed and, you know, we used it as, as entertainment uh, or edutainment uh, for them. Um, when when it was time to watch a video or time for a little bit of entertainment, we'd try to find something on form that would, would suit the needs and maybe show teach us a little bit about the saint of the day or the season. Okay, okay. Uh, Teresa and Jordan, anything to add? Yeah, um, in terms of your previous question, um, something that I really valued is just really slowing down. Um, mm -hmm. And in the slowing down, we, mm -hmm developed a routine that we've never really had before that included um, intentional times of prayer, um, mm -hmm. times of fun for the family, um, music, and partly I think in the effort to make sure that we were kind of offering some of the balance that maybe they would have got at school, um, but partly just to try to um, enjoy this time together uh, as a family. And so I think I will be carrying forward that routine, um, as much as I can. And, um, in, and another piece of that too, is I had a realization that I think as parents, sometimes we compare ourselves to other families a lot. And so one thing I used to do is think like, look at my friends and see like, oh, they've got their kids in dance and you know, basketball and this and that and the other thing. And you kind of think to be a good parent, I have to have my kid in all of these things. Mm -hmm. And with five kids, that can become a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so all of a sudden they were nothing and we were home with them. And it made me realize I, like a big epiphany for me is how much I actually want to place the value on our time together as a family over and above all of these you know, having them in all the things. <laughs> um, and that I can let go of some of that guilt, maybe, that said that I was a bad mom if they weren't in all of the things. Um, and so I want to hold on to that for sure. And in terms of your second question, um, just a couple things that come to mind. Um, we try to do like daily prayer with them. So we like pray as you go and I'll like post it up on my TV. And so we all listen to it together. Um, and then another thing that comes to mind is I love using like little clips for them, like either, um, from alpha for kids or, um, like there's some really good productions through the U S like, um, I think it's father Krishnit or, mm. um, anyway, there's a few, mm -hmm. uh, really good ones that, um, like little five minute segments of like, you know, why do people say this and that about the Catholic church? And I find that's really engaging for the kids. And then we can have a conversation about it. And the other piece too, we found um, 
like with the music piece, there was great opportunities because you're always looking for a little bit of variety at times, just so that, you know, maybe the kids um, uh, don't get bored with something, but just in regards to music, it was a great opportunity to, uh, for us to maybe learn a new song on the guitar for the kids to, uh, uh, to, to learn a new song. And uh, that was nice because we had the time and then we had the, uh, the structure to do it. And uh, I found that valuable in that, you know, previously we're all at school or we're all at work. So, you know, we couldn't come together at noon to pray. And then I found myself, you know, anticipating it and wanting it. And, uh, and that was a, a gift that, you know, I didn't see uh, that could come from this. You know, I, I think it might've been you, Teresa. I read something about, um, uh, or maybe Jordan, about your one shower rosary. And I thought, oh, is that ever nice? Is yeah, that... I never thought that even my four-year-old could sit through like oh. the 15 minutes or, you know, 18 minutes it takes to pray a rosary. And mm. after a couple of weeks, my four-year-old was leading the decades, if you can honestly believe that. <laughs> um, so they, they shocked me. I think I underestimated what my kids were able to do. So an inspiration for all of us. <laughs> So, Sister um, Lucinda, you mentioned live streaming of Mass. So, what has been the uh, live streaming of Mass experience for you and, and those around you? Well, it's, I guess it's like for all of us, Eucharist is so important. But when the prayer is said, when we're unable to receive and are receiving spiritually, it's like it's it's mixed emotions because it's joy and sorrow and I because uh, I usually on Sundays are from the, our basilica here in Edmonton and it's like and I'm so grateful for the people who are able to be there so but so it's joyful but very hard at the same time so I'm very grateful that we have the opportunity. Great. Greg and Tess, how about you? Well, like uh, Teresa and Jordan, uh, praying the rosary together as a family virtually is one of the greatest values that we want to hold on going forward. You now, every Sunday night, we see our children, four children, along with our five grandchildren, praying the rosary together. What a wonderful opportunity to be together as a family. As we are saying that the family that prays together stays, stays together. And then for, for us seniors, we just go home. And now we have the opportunity to watch uh, Mass daily. daily online. You know, the live streaming of Mass serves as our, I would say, highway to holiness during this time of the pandemic. And this allows us, especially senior members like us, just to stay home and receive spiritual communion and thereby stay more safe from contracting the coronavirus outside. That's wonderful. <laughs> yes, it sure is. Um, Deacon Gerald and Marion? For us, you know, we went from phase one where there was no mass to phase two where we had the live streaming and our, our local parish priests as well as our archbishop um, would preside at those. And what was unique about that is that it's been a long time since our three daughters and, and we were in mass together because one lives in Edmonton and two live here and they would out, you know, they didn't have the same schedule. So one would go to Saturday evening and the other would go to Sunday morning or whatever, but there was only the one mass. So we'd all be in mass together. The daughter in Edmonton would join us at the mass here. So it was neat. And yeah, so we, that was, that was good. And uh, I, I hate to say it, but the text messaging was going uh, back and forth and wishing each other, you know, the sign of peace, not the, not the public one, but, uh, and then it was also good because Marion's aunt from Burlington, who was quite um, isolated at the time, would also join us here um, for Grand Prairie Mass uh, live stream. So we'd see her come on on Facebook. And, and so it was, it was really unifying. And I, I, our priests were, they were missing Mass. They were missing the crowds. And, and I sort of 
played a role there, re reminding them that, you know, this was a little bit like the early church where we weren't able to celebrate mass the way we have for the last few hundred years in a public place without worry. And so then when we got to move into phase three, um, I, was, I was a little hesitant. You know, I had been living in a sheltered world and I hadn't been exposed and I was uh, staying quite isolated. Okay, well, uh, full disclosure here, I had to tell him to get out from under his rock. <laughs> <laughs> and she needed to... But, but, <laughs> but when phase, phase three hit, and we actually did go to, um, to live mass again um, with the new restrictions, you know, it brought me to tears. Yes. Um, yes. Because yes. We, we did get to celebrate it, and I missed it. Yeah, yeah. It's this opportunity for us to... Uh, uh, peek in on other masses. Uh, I know my husband, when, when we aren't able to get in through registering at, at the Basilica, uh, will watch Archbishop Smith's mass. And then when that finishes, he'll turn to the Ukrainian mass at St. Josephus and watch that. Sometimes he'll even go to New Westminster and check out what's happening there. So <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good experience. Um, with the many changes to our previous normal, what do you think is making families stronger today? And who all is playing a role in, in that building of strength? Well, grandparents, for sure. But my heart aches for the people. Uh, I mean, grandpa is pretty, well, it may not be as transient now, but there are people here who don't have families here who don't have grandparents who live close by. So we are so blessed that we... Uh, live close and it's helped to make our family stronger. Um, if grandparents aren't close by, you know, I think it's got to be the, the young people uh, who don't have uh, family they need to have a good strong support system like the neighbors who, I mean, the lady next door has a whole bunch of, of uh, kids. She's a daycare and her daycare has been open the whole time and she, I believe she's been great support for her families. So uh, I think that that's, um, it, it's helping to make families uh, stronger if they have a support system. And I believe that the church here has really helped, like some parishioners have been calling uh, those that they need, uh, know are in need and trying to connect with them uh, during this time, maybe visit them socially at a socially distancing or physical distance uh, in a physical distance manner. Um, so I think that's helped. I think our technology today, as you know, as as um, other people have said, you know, they they zoom with their grandkids and things like that. And I mean, we think back to the last pandemic, where you know, a hundred years ago, where you know, they might have been able to send letters, but they were probably scared to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very different than it is today, where you know, sometimes we're hanging around the house and we're getting FaceTime messages from our grandkids wanting help with their homework. So, you know, things, are, things have changed so much and the technology has made it much easier. I sure. mean, let's face it, 100 years ago, we did, nobody could have live streamed Mass. Exactly. We without. Sister Lucinda, any insights on this one from the families that are around you? Unfortunately, I'd have to say no because our work is with families that are fractured. Okay, so no opportunity there. I think um, one thing that I've noticed from this is, you know, um, you'd get this steady flow of days and the weekend would arrive and usually the weekend feels different than the, uh, the weekdays. But for the kids when, you know, they were uh, out of school, um, you know, you started to see that pattern and you notice them, you know, when is this going to be over? When is this going to be over? And so uh, it created some opportunities to be creative uh, because, you know, you couldn't maybe do your regular things of going and getting a coffee or, or hanging out and, and grabbing a lunch together and, you know, going to the play place or, or wherever it was. But, um, you know, uh, I found, you know, it got us outside more. Um, you know, the kids really enjoy going to the driving range with me. You can socially distance there. And um, uh, so that was nice having that dad time. But another key piece was that time together 
you know, you see a range of emotions. And, uh, you know, what was big for Teresa and I was, um, you know, we're able to um, model in front of the kids, you know, resolving conflict um, and, you know, the forgiveness piece. So, you know, when, when their kids, you know, see their dad who maybe messed up or, or reacted poorly and, um, and then coming back to mom or, or coming back to the, the three-year-old saying, you know, I shouldn't have talked to you like a three-year-old, um, then, uh, you know, they're able to see that, um, you know, how to model, you know, being sorry for something and, and asking for forgiveness for someone. So as much as there was good, you know, there was the range, you know, you know, when you're wrong, promptly admitting it with, uh, with the kids and then being able to see that. A whole lot more observance for them of life in the family. Absolutely. What it looks like. So, uh, Teresa and Jordan, I'm going to ask you if you could start us off on the response to this question. What conversation did you have with your children in preparation for them to go to school? And now that they are in, I'm guessing, and uh, coming home, what, what's the conversation from them on return? Well, I think... Um First of all, to back up, it became a really long conversation between Jordan and I. And I can tell you that was the case for a lot of my friends. Making that decision, whether to send them back or not, and if we are to keep them home, what, what to kind of do. Uh, like, do you do the homeschooling? Do you do online school? That was not an easy decision. And I know so many families who struggled with that decision. Um, it felt like you were choosing between multiple not great options. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually when we're discerning something as a couple, there's a, like one or two good options. But um, so, yeah, then that's really hard as a parent because you want to do what's best for your kid. Um, and so when your kids are saying they miss their friends, but you're feeling like I, it might not be the best thing for them to go back. So anyway, um, we, after lots of conversations between the two of us and then in, and then eventually including our kids one by one in that conversation, uh, we made the decision to do the online schooling. Mm -hmm. So my husband's back, Jordan's back uh, in school, but the kids are all doing online school. So I'm now juggling working remotely and um, doing some and doing the online school with my kids. So and for me, you know, I'm able to see the uh, you know the resiliency of of my kids, my students at school, and just how you know there was maybe this fear going back. Like, you know, are they going to be able to handle it? Are they going to be overwhelmed? And, you know, we're, we're two and a half weeks in and they've just been amazing. Um, it's been so wonderful to have them back in the building, you know, to, uh, to talk about the NBA bubble with a bunch of my junior high kids and, uh, you know, who's on their fantasy football team. Um, those conversations, you don't realize how much they were part of your day. And, you know, when the kids were gone, you know, it was an empty building. And, uh, you know, the school is the people there. And, um, and so that's been, you know, a, a blessing for me knowing, you know, what families are, are going through and then to being, uh, being able to see those kids, um, you know, that's been a gift for me too. But as Teresa said, it was a, a difficult conversation. And, you know, we had a chat, you know, we have a son who's going into high school. And, you know, we all know that high school experience. And, uh, and so there's been challenges, but we're happy, you know, with it. And we're taking things a day at a time. And, you know, as we've seen, things can change, you know, uh, very quickly with COVID. But, um, you know, that's our, that's our current reality. Jordan, did you hear any surprise comments from the kids as they came back into school? Things that you hadn't heard before, perhaps? Uh, well, they noticed uh, I had lost the man bun and I didn't have the beard anymore. Um, so I'd really miss those. I always i am careful with that because it shocks kids. Like, you've got a haircut. Um, <laughs> but uh, just to see, what, you know, what's a gift is, is those kids that, you know, maybe struggled to attend before, um, they are back. And, um, and that's a gift to see them, you know, with, uh, sister uh, Lucinda can attest, you know, sometimes you want those, those welfare check-ins, you know, to see how a kid is doing. And when we didn't see our students, you know, for three months, those who were maybe, you know, at an, uh, in a difficult situation, we couldn't check in with. Um, and so uh, that's been a gift. Uh, those students that, you know, struggled with attendance, uh, a lot of them are back uh, because, you know, they, 
they want to see their friends, um, you know, maybe that time away thinking, oh, school isn't that bad. Um, but uh, it, again, you know, you, you see those conversations that you missed, you know, because of the, you know, the three months we were away and, um, and just those kids engaging in those with you as a principal, you know, which what I, I don't remember doing as a kid. Um, and so uh, that's been a real blessing for me. Greg and Tess, did you hear anything um, from your grandchildren about their experience going to school? Well, <laughs> they are both homeschooling. <laughs> oh, I'm batting a thousand. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and their parents are both uh, working at home. So okay. they are the ones who guide them. Okay, sure. Logan? Yes. The wonderful have... things, you know, with our grandchildren, at the end of the day, they will show us through this uh, social media the artworks that they have done or probably the uh, songs that they have composed and they will sing it to us. That's the beauty of these things. We can easily right away see or <laughs> what they have done during the day. Sure, sure. Logan's any comments from your grandchildren? They're homeschooling. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the teachers. <laughs> it, it was moving uh, along. <laughs> was a, but it was a big decision. Like Teresa and Jordan, we can completely relate with what you're saying because our daughter had extended conversations with the ten and the twelve year old, and we have a great deal of admiration for the teachers and what's happening in education. Uh, the kids get valuable. Uh, online learning and they get uh, something in religion every day and we are uh, very happy with with how it's going. We would like the 12 year old to understand that a paragraph is more than one sentence but <laughs> that may come with time. <laughs> yeah the it, it was a really hard decision for our daughter it was uh, and she went back and forth a few, a few times. So for a while they were going to be going back to school and then they were going to go to home. They were going to do remote learning and, and then it, it changed. And in the end, uh, her decision was to do remote learning. Tough decisions, tough decisions. So Sister Lucinda, we're hearing there has been a rise in child abuse and domestic violence in Alberta due to the pandemic. Is this the case? And if so, can you share causes and responses to this increase? Well, unfortunately, domestic violence and child abuse, it is higher. Um, whether it's totally related to pandemic, there were people on different sides are going to say different things, but just in Edmonton itself, 27% increase in violence mm -hmm. is what police are dealing with. This is what they've said. And I'm very mindful that in the past 36 days in Canada that we've had 10 domestic homicides of women, two right here in Alberta. So the glaring issue, I, sometimes my prayer is if we knew the causes, then as a kind you know, as a group, we could make a difference. But they're so varied and so diverse. So unemployment, loss of income for so many families, some would say that's a part of it. I don't know though, because domestic violence, I think it goes a lot deeper. And I continue to say, even though it's old fashioned, is that it's probably about power and control. And unfortunately, even though we try through Lorena Shelter to encourage women to, to return to whatever faith they are a part of, because that's often one of some of the abuse, women, it's like they're afraid to reach out to their faith community. They don't want people to know. So, we keep trying to say, don't be afraid. We haven't found a good solution for that. But I would say, and I'm very grateful for our Archbishop. He has always been a champion about domestic violence and trying to have all of our parishes be mindful of it. So very grateful for that. 
So in that regard, sister, are there activities our church could undertake to foster greater appreciation and support for these families in the community? Or I've been pondering that question, and I was thinking, I think because of COVID-19 and all the restrictions, I almost wonder, and um, it, it's that whole thing, if a, a parish family even just reaches out to each other that whether it's a, a simple call or just it's like, sometimes I think a simple step like that could help, but even more important sometimes if anyone ever has the opportunity and is listening to someone who's doing that type of sharing, I think it's about truly listening because that will make kilometers of difference and it could really help a person make appropriate decisions. Good thing to remember, listening more. Thank you, sister. You're welcome. In a recent article in the Catholic Register by Jerry Turcott, who's the president of St. Mary's University in Calgary, he says, to create both a healthy self and a healthy planet is by tending the garden of the soul. What do you see as a personal action to tend the garden of your soul? Deacon, can we start with you? Well, you know, that's one of the blessings I think of of this, um, the pandemic is that it, and other people have referred to this, is it gives us more time. And, you know, so more time for reflection, more time for reading scripture, more time for reading um, books that are going to nourish that uh, a garden of our soul. And I think that's a, one of the silver linings of this. And, uh, and just reflecting, I mean, other people have talked about now being able to stream daily mass. And that's one of the silver linings that, that we've encountered not working now. Uh, we do make it to way more daily masses than we did um, when we were both working and things like that. Greg and Tess, anything for you about what you do for the garden of your soul? Well, uh, it's really part of our uh, way of life here in the community couples for Christ that we uh, thought how to really come to the Lord every now and then, come to Him, ask for forgiveness, and uh, be joyful to all whatever blessings that we receive every day. So communion with God, prayer, seek His face every day, uh, join the, uh, the Mass virtually, praying the Rosary, I think, and reflection, that's what uh, Deacon has mentioned. We have to take some time to really reflect on what's going on in our life and um, see the goodness of, the, of God, that everything has happened for a very good purpose. That's why this pandemic has happened. So I say, let's take the opportunity. Let's not uh, look at it as a crown of suffering, <laughs> corona of suffering, but the crown of opportunity for us to enrich our spiritual life. Thank you. Thank you. I just read the other day somewhere where it says it's so important for individuals to have quiet time and to sit for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, you know, today we should be able to give 15 minutes to just sit in silence and, and enjoy what's around us and observe all that God has given us. So we'll do more of that. So what are your friends saying about their mass attendance moving forward when the limits are lifted and we can fill our churches to the brim? What, what are you hearing? Well, it's, it's been interesting talking with, uh, with our priests. And, you know, we've, here at St. Joe's, it's been slow, slow return once we were allowed to, uh, to return. So... Our, you know, we started off with three masses and now we're at four. We went from probably about 15% capacity. We're probably up to about 20, 25% capacity now. And we do have some masses that are, are selling out. Um, there's still space available. But everybody is in a, in a slow return mode. Um, and Father Remy, our parish priest, he says, you know, when I go to the gym, it's empty. 
Uh, I hear people in the restaurants, they're empty. You know, people are just not comfortable going out into that environment. And it's going to be a slow return to mass as well. And I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's fairly busy at St. Joe's now, but, um, you know, it, it will be slow as well. Teresa and Jordan, well, what are you hearing? I think, you know, people are, are taking precautions. I know um, the, uh, you know, if you think about your, uh, your routine as a family and getting ready to go, you know, to a 9 a.m. or a, an 11 a.m. mass, um, you know, you need about 25 minutes minimum uh, when you're going. And, uh, and when it's Zoom, you know, or, or YouTube, you need about three minutes. Um, so there's that side where, uh, you know, you see the, the benefits there and you don't have to comb everyone's hair. Um, but, um, you know, our hope is, is that, um, you know, we, we can return. You know, just sitting here thinking about this, you know, Easter was during COVID. And, um, you know, that just struck me. It sat with me today. I was, we were uh, talking about uh, liturgical calendars at school. And it struck me that, you know, our, our highest point of the year, you know, we spent, you know, where we're supposed to be together, uh, you know, everyone, you know, uh, spent in the, you know, domestic church celebrating at home. Um, and that, that saddened me in, in that thinking of, you know, how, how wonderful the Triduum is and all the smells and the literal bells and whistles, you know, for the, uh, for the Alleluia. And, um, you know, there's excitement for me to uh, return. And I, I just think, you know, as, uh, you know, the Logans were saying, you know, a lot of places are empty. So I think a lot of people are thinking, go slow to go fast. And our country, you know, has done a, a good job of, you know, flattening the curve and, and just being optim um, optimistic and, and to be cautious about it. But, um, you know, there's a longing to return, uh, absolutely. Um, and just to echo that, um, from like my perspective as working at the U of A, um, my students are very uh, Zoom tired. There's like Zoom fatigue. Uh, they are just longing for that connection and longing to be back with the mass. Like, it's almost like every time I talk to them, they're asking me if there's any word about whether we can return, you know, because the college has such a small chapel that it's really not safe for us to do in-person mass right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I have this image of when we return, we're going to be like overflowing. And I don't know <laughs> if that's going to be true or not, but I think their hearts are just like hungry for that. Right. Sister Lucinda, what about your, your circle of, of people? <laughs> uh, are, are they just waiting for that door to open uh, without yeah. having to do yeah. this? Yes, and hopefully open where there's not going to have to be any fear. I think fear is, you know, it's it's kind of, uh, it's just such an awful thing because yeah. everyone is, it's just one of those things you just don't want to think that you could get COVID or, or anything like that. And I mean, and I know that's the constant, the being able to get back, like that will be uh, a wondrous opportunity, you know. And I would say some of our staff have their children going to school, but they're very concerned waiting for the call from the school saying their child has to come home, you know. So that we're looking and saying, okay, what do we do when the parent gets that call? So, and they did it, they have their children going because they so desperately needed to see friends and their teachers. So it's a, it's a very um, difficult time, but I think in, for everyone, it's, I guess we're all going to appreciate so much what we haven't been able to do that it'll be like Easter every day. Right. What's that saying? You don't know what you've lost until you don't have it anymore? Yeah. I have one more question. We'll uh, go through this one a little quicker. Um, I recently watched a YouTube video by the U.S. Catholic Conference of Catholic Bishops, and it was hosted by Bishop Robert Barron, and it was called 
reaching out to the religiously unaffiliated. It spoke of youth as young as 13, deciding not to be part of the church, their faith, and just abandoning the church. With that knowledge, what do we need to do to move forward? How, can we learn something from that? Teresa, you're smiling. Um, yeah, when I was doing my, my MDiv at Newman, uh, I came across an article that spoke about um, that one of the greatest predictors of youth um, keeping their faith as adults was not their involvement like in youth groups or these other kinds of things, but it was whether or not they had parents who participated um, in their faith outside of the Sunday Mass. So yes, going to Mass was great, but the stats went up just significantly if they were actually practicing their faith day to day. And that always really stuck with me because I think it's one of our greatest fears is to do all the things right and still you know you don't have control over what ultimately your kids decide. Um, not that we do all the things right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's my also my greatest hope is that you know if Jordan and I are as parents doing what we can, what are what's in our control to live out our faith the best that we can, which means being involved with social justice, um, you know, going to confession, modeling, like Jordan said, said saying sorry in front of our kids when we make mistakes. Um, all of those things, that's my hope, is that, that they will grow up to be adults who still embrace their faith. Um, I think the youth groups and all those things are great, but I think the primary responsibility is on us as parents. Yeah. I, I still remember I was probably 15 years old um, and this community member had made a, an outdoor rink and it was uh, three o'clock, beautiful winter day. And uh, I remember my mom pulling up at 4.45 PM because uh, we went to, to 5 PM mass. And like, she called me over and I ignored her and, you know, she like beat the horn and, and I ignored her. And it was like just the most perfect day for the outdoor rink. And um, I, so I begrudgingly went over and went to the bench and took my gear off. And, um, you know, I, I don't recall getting a lot out of that mass, <laughs> but looking back as a dad, um, you know, I can't, you know, thank my mom enough for that, you know, making the, you know, for us, we went to the Saturday evening mass, but, um, you know, just that importance in the moment, not seeing it, but, you know, 20 years later, you know, just wanting to give her, a, you know, a hug because in, in university, then I sought out, you know, the, the UVic Catholic students group when I was there. And, you know, it was that longing that I experienced as a child, you know, of, of that, um, that weekly mass. So for me, you know, I'm grateful for that. And I think as parents, you know, as to what Teresa said, but also the importance of the Mass. Okay. okay, well, thank you for that. So we've come to the end of our time together here today. On behalf of the Catholic Bishops of Alberta and the Territories, I want to thank all of our panelists for engaging in today's topic and for opening up this reflection theme for us. Sister Lucinda, Teresa and Jordan, Tess and Greg, Marion and Deacon Gerald, well done. Today's session, however, is just the beginning. Our bishops encourage all of us to hold similar reflections within our homes and schools and workplaces and society in general. So a reminder that the reflection guides prepared by the bishops, complete with questions to ponder and recommended readings on today's topic can be found on Grandin Media website. If you would like to provide the bishops with comments or feedback on this topic, there is a feedback option on the website as well, and they would love to hear what you have to uh, say. A reminder to join us again next week for a reflection on individual rights and social responsibilities. As we conclude our time together today, let us join in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, our refuge in every danger, to whom we turn in our distress. In faith we pray, look with compassion on the afflicted, grant eternal rest to the dead, 
comfort to mourners, healing to the sick, peace to the dying, strength to healthcare workers, wisdom to our leaders, and the courage to reach out to all in love, so that together we may give glory to your holy name. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone, and God bless.